I want to speak to you tonight about the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, you know, there, there are some things in uh, our Christian life that we just never move on from, okay? And the anointing is one of those things. You, you can grow in grace and learn and do and graduate and so on and so on. And uh, some of the things we used to do when we were younger Christians, it may be leaving behind a little bit, but, but appreciating the anointing and the presence of the Holy Spirit is one of those things that you want to hang on to for dear life forever and ever and ever and never let go of it. Because we're not talking about just an experience or an encounter. We're talking about the person of the Holy Spirit being with us continually. How many want that? And so I think there are times when he just falls on the place and nobody asks for anything, but there are other times when he expects us to pursue him and to go for it. So whatever way it goes tonight, how many can honestly say, Lord, I want more of you. I want more of you. And this is, this is so good to be in a, in, a, in a church that's more or less full and, and we can have a proper conference again. This is the, 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 the first time in a in about two years, I mean, and uh, it's just so good, everybody. And so I want you to enjoy yourselves in the anointing tonight as we, as we get filled up with love and joy and peace. What does it look like when Christians get full of joy? And full of love even, and full of peace even. I mean, it, all through the nine gifts of the Spirit. And so uh, we want to talk about the anointing today. And the word in English comes from the word ointment. And that really is the same root in Hebrew and in Greek, the languages of the Bible. If somebody near you is really just getting it, just, yeah, just give them another dose right now. Just give them another shot. Because that's what it's all about here. The... The Hebrew word is the word Messiah, really, Mashiach, the anointed one, the Messiah. The Greek equivalent of that is Christos, from, from where we get words like Christian, meaning you and I, little anointed ones, as it's the diminutive form of, of that Greek word. And it all has to do with the anointing or the smearing on the rubbing on of this invisible presence of the Holy Spirit, much like one would rub oil or ointment upon, upon your own body. And the neat thing about oil-based substances like that is that there is a residual effect there. It doesn't quickly evaporate. And so we want to talk about receiving that anointing and honoring that anointing because we've, we've got a bit of work to do before this thing's all over. How many, how many understand? So let me have a text for this before we get going. Let's open our Bibles to John chapter 6 and verse 63. Jesus is speaking, and he says this, it is the Spirit who gives life, 
The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. And so as we think about that verse and meditate on it, it's calling us to attempt to move away from doing things in our own initiative, in our own self-effort, in the flesh, and moving towards letting the Holy Spirit be the one who's leading us and initiating and taking us in the direction we want to go. So how many of you want the Holy Spirit to have a greater uh, part to play in all of this as, as we get going into the next chapter? Now, there, there's a lot I could say um, when, when we're talking about our Christian faith. There's so many dimensions, you know. You, 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 it's hard to narrow it down. But when we talk about the three journeys that you are on, you and I are on, the inward journey for you, for your healing, your equipping, your, your strengthening uh, for you as a Christian. Then there's the upward journey, which is for him, for you to worship him and praise him and honor him. And then there's the outward journey where you give this away and you win the lost and uh, you disciple other people. And so there's a different focus and we're, we're talking today mostly about you receiving an anointing. So in the inward journey, so that now you can be much more effective as you give this away and outreach to other people. And so uh, I've, I've just noticed that when it comes to the supernatural, people are interested in things like physical healing. How many need a physical healing in the room tonight besides me? Okay. We're, we're interested in that. And uh, we're, we're interested in getting prophetic words. How many need a, like to hear from God? I need a sense of direction of what I'm to do. Like uh, uh, life is kind of piling up and we need God. We've got to hear from you. We need a prophetic word. And so that's important as well. But I learned something many years ago uh, when Carol and I went to Indonesia for the second time. We went uh, a, a year after we were married. So we were married in 1979. In 1980, we went to Indonesia to visit the revival there. And that resulted in us uh, making a major shift. We, we said, Lord, we cannot give our lives to business anymore. We, we, we need to go in the ministry. And uh, he made it very clear. We told him we'd do anything, we'd go anywhere. And he said, good, go back to Carol's hometown and uh, plant a church there and begin a church there. And so we did that uh, a year later in June of 1981. We started uh, Jubilee church there in Stratford and the pastor of that wonderful church is with us tonight. Stand up, give us a wave, Trevor. Yeah. And so all this wonderful movement that we were, Duncan's video was all about, uh, you know, began right back there in Carol's hometown. Well, when the revival broke out in Toronto now, the fast forward to 94, we were invited to Indonesia, and I think by the time we got there, it was something about 96, uh, yeah, 1996 or seven possibly. And uh, we noticed that there wasn't a great interest in healing. And they were saying to me, oh, because Carol and I were wanting more people to get healed, you know. Oh, God, use us to heal the sick and that sort of thing. And they're like, no, we, we, we have lots of that. What we want is to be touched by the Holy Spirit and to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Wow. And it was just over and over and over again. And... And the people were waiting for hours for their turn to get prayer so they could 
be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'll never forget that because by this time we were not getting used to it, but you know, we're, we're, we're thinking we need to move on a little bit. We've, we've, how many times do you fall down before you see the, what, what else is there, you know? <laughs> I learned a very important lesson that night. You never, ever move on from the anointing and powerful presence of the Holy Spirit. <sighs> and so that was a takeaway for us. And carrying the anointing is a very precious thing. And we talk about impartation and how do you get more? And uh, I think our first, my first real encounter with the, that kind of an anointing was with Catherine Kuhlman and the healings and she would always pray for people and invariably fall over. Now it was a model where she did all the ministry and, and they kind of did them one at a time. So you pray for one person and then get them out of the way and pray for the next one. But what happened to us was sort of an explosion that happened on January 20, 94, where the whole room full of people, there was about 130 of us that night, and uh, they, they were just all over the place, under the chairs, between the rows, in the aisles, overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit and their shaking, rolling, laughing, jerking, yelling, crying. I mean, it was just the most wonderfully bizarre thing I have ever seen in my whole life. And we fell in love with it, that God was moving so powerfully, and we want to hang on to that. But we quickly learned that as you soak in that presence night after night after night, you, you caught something so that you then became armed and dangerous. Wow. And we learned something else, and that was uh, the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit was not limited to doing it within the four walls of church. And so we had restaurant experiences right from the beginning. We'd meet a group of visitors and have breakfast with them and the next thing you know, everybody's under the table right in the hotel. <laughs> and it, it, so it went and we realized this is supposed to get out there for the whole world to see and desire. So this, this is where it's all meant to go. Oh, Lord, what can I say? Uh, how many want the anointing to increase in your life? <laughs> Moses passed it on to the 70 others. And remember, two guys were late for the meeting, and they got it anyway, right, right, in, the, right in the camp. El Dad and Me Dad, I think's their name. And uh, yeah, Samuel prayed for two young men, Saul and David. Whose anointing would you like, Saul's or David's? How many want David's anointing? Wave at me. How many want Saul's anointing? Wave at me. Yeah, see, there's absolutely no difference. The difference is what you do with it. And so that's where accountability comes in. So therefore, there's a lot we could say about your motivation. I mean, there's four things I like to see in my heart and yours. Trust that is built from character, godly character, then competency in the anointing, be good at what you do, and then have the right motive. It's love that propels us. 
and then have a good history, a track record. Ten years, looking back ten years, you're able to see that you've been faithful with it. This is, this is the look we're going for. And uh, there's a whole lot of things that help, some things that hinder, but faith will help your anointing. Humility will help your anointing. You know the Lord loves humility. Carol and I always cringe a bit when our dear sons in the faith will give us a big build up, you know, and say, let's give John and Carol a standing ovation. And we're like, oh, you know. <laughs> I know, I know. But it still, it makes us still feel a little strange. Because, you know, I, we, we know better than, every, than anyone else. It's, it's, it's nothing to do with us and everything to do with him. And so we just, you know, Carol loves to tell the donkey story. Um, about this little donkey went in and out of Jerusalem every day and one day he came back and he's just kind of strutting around the barn and you know his chest puffed out and his mother says hey what's with you today he says oh mom today this is really something he says as I went into the city everybody's throwing palm branches in front of me and they're yelling Hosanna to the king and all that man, man I'm really something she says, I hate to burst your balloons, but it wasn't you that were exalting. It's the one you were carrying. So see, as long as you can remember that, just be a good donkey. How many think they could be a good donkey? So to pick up on our text, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says the same thing, sort of. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit. The things of the Spirit are foolishness to him, neither does he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. So there's this, uh, the natural way of doing things but then there's the way of the Holy Spirit to do it and I can tell you that very often the way of the Holy Spirit is not exactly cool looking all right sometimes cool might be another word for pride sometimes could be but what happened was Jesus came to John the Baptist. He was baptized in water. Heaven opened and the Father spoke. The Holy Spirit descended like a dove and he was empowered and then energized by the affirmation of the Father's love. And the Spirit took him into the wilderness where he is tested uh, for 40 days. And he returned from that in the power of the Spirit. Mark chapter 6 verse 4 tells us that he went to Nazareth and he did not get a really warm reception there. Uh, and he made the comment that a prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown and among his own people. Now I read that for many, many years and I just assumed that that's the way it is. But you know something? I've, I've pivoted on that a little bit. I don't think that's the way it's supposed to be. It's just that when you really get to know people, you tend to look to them after the flesh rather than after the spirit that is anointing them. So, Let's go to Luke 4 and verse 14. We'll begin at verse 14. Luke chapter 4 is the parallel passage where Jesus returns in the power of the Spirit and he goes to his hometown of Nazareth. So I'm going to read the whole thing. I'll read in the New King James and you can, you can read along as well. 
Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out through all the surrounding region, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. That's a good custom, by the way, to, to gather together with people of faith every week. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it, was, where it is written, which is Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. But then something shifted in the room. And they said, that's Some others said, hang on a minute, is this not Joseph's son? And there's an inference here. Who does he think he is? What does he think he's saying? So he said to them, you will surely say this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. And he said, as surely I say to you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah when heaven was shut up three years, six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. And they rose up and thrust him out of the city, and they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. Then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. I love how Jesus always gets away, don't you? Can you imagine going to your own hometown, fresh from a power encounter with the Holy Spirit, and uh, getting up and reading unto the anointing, And then just, by the way, pointing out that, uh, so you got to, when you read the word, you got to try to figure out what was it that upset those people so much that they were ready to try to kill one of their own hometown boys. He pointed out this. Why is it the people of God are forever missing the blessing of God? You know, there were many widows in Elijah's time. But God didn't send him to any of those. But to this uh, Gentile widow over there on the coast. And there were many lepers in Elisha's time, but none of them were healed, except Naaman the Syrian. And they were so upset at that that they were prepared to kill him and throw him off the cliff. And... uh, 
you know, you read that and you think, boy, it doesn't take much to get them upset. <laughs> But it's incredible to me that um, he got that kind of a reaction. But I want to point out one thing, and that's, that is this, that um, Jesus now is not ashamed of the anointing that's on his life. So he's not walking in some kind of arrogance here. But he is being honest. And he's, he's really saying, you know, the, the one that, I, that you grew up with, that guy is no more. Because something's happened to him. He was baptized in water and baptized in the Holy Spirit and affirmed by the Father's love and launched successfully past the testings and trial and he's like, now I'm here and I'm fully on mission, everybody. And he says to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your ears. And some people went, wow, and others reacted. Now when the anointing comes suddenly, uh, on someone you used to know, and now they're, they're, you, you see them on fire, you have, to, you have to move with them into the new, new. Right? Carol mentioned our, our granddaughter Jessica was just with us last week, and uh, she lives in England, she came over, and I tell you what, she was on fire for God. Now, she's always been, you know, on fire to a degree, but not, not at this level. And uh, she was just so passionate for him. It stirred us up, and we're like, oh, come on, Jess, pray for us. We want to get going in this, too. <laughs> And so make sure you don't react jealously about people who are more excited about Jesus than you are, won't you? <laughs> just, just nudge your spouse and say, help me, honey. <laughs> there were many lepers and, uh, you know, I think we have time to get a bit of this in. The story of Naaman is told in 2 Kings chapter 5, 1 to 16. And Naaman was a great Syrian commander. And he was notorious for winning battles for the king of Syria, or Aram. But here's his problem. He was a leper. You know, that can spoil your career. <laughs> because people don't want to get that close to you when you've got leprosy. But imagine they, they had captured a little Israeli girl from a raid, and she ended up in his house, and she's serving in their house. I don't know how old she was, maybe seven or eight or 12. And this little girl, instead of being all angry and full of bitterness and hatred toward them, she, she has compassion. And she's saying, oh, if only, if only my master could go to the prophet who's in Israel, being Elisha, he would cure him of his leprosy. Now see, people who are desperate are really desperate enough to try almost anything. I'm sure he'd gone through a hundred different doctors and treatments to the best of his ability. And so he hears this little slave girl telling him there's a prophet in Israel that can help him. 
He goes to the king, tells the story, and the king says, go, I'll write you a letter. And they write a letter, and you know what? He takes so much gold and silver, I mean, goodness, it's like, let me, let me just, um, he departed, he took with him 10 talents of silver. A talent is about 80 pounds, so 800 pounds of silver, um, 6,000 shekels or coins of gold and 10 changes of clothing. And he went to the king of Israel with the letter, which read, now be advised when this letter comes to you that I have sent Naaman, my servant, to you that you may heal him of his leprosy. So the king of Israel freaks out and tears his robes and says, he's trying to pick a fight with us. That's what he's trying to do. I mean, we, we can't help this guy or whatever. But Elisha hears about it. And I want you to notice what Elisha says. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king had torn his clothes, this is verse 8 of 2 Kings 5, that he sent to the king saying, why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Now see, once again, Elisha is not being prideful and boasting here. He's being honest about the anointing that's resting on his life. Now see, there's times where you could, you could move into a false humility with stuff like that and say, oh, well, I'm, I'm not that great. I mean, you know, it's a, but no. We need to be honest about the reality of the anointing and the presence of the Holy Spirit, don't you think? Elisha said, send him to me and he'll find out there's an anointed man of God in this nation. So here comes Naaman knocking on his door. And Elisha, I suppose, is about to go and open the door, but he gets a check and is like, no. Nah, He's not quite ready yet. Send one of the students and give him a message. Hi. The man of God says, go dip yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will become like the flesh of a little child. Okay. Bye. And he leaves. And Naaman now is furious. What? I've come all this way to have some unknown tell me to go take a bath in the Jordan. And he's absolutely furious. And he's about to head home. And here's the importance of having friends around you that care. Because his friends got around him. And they said, my father, my father. Listen, if the man had asked you to do some grandiose thing, some difficult thing, you would have done it. It's like climb the mountain, offer 10 bulls as a sacrifice, sign the contract, you'll never invade Israel again, and do this and do that and do the other. You would have said, happy to do it. You know why? Because now it feels like you've contributed a little bit. Like you, you know, it's fair enough then, sure. And they talked him into it. Look, he, how much more should you be willing just to do the simple thing? Okay, what's, what's this going to cost him really? His dignity. It's going to require his humility. So you got to picture this. They, they go to the Jordan River. How many have been to the Jordan River? I mean, it's about from here to the wall wide, depending on what part you're at. And it's very muddy in both banks, and the water's muddy and whatever. 
So he's going to take off his general's robe, and there he is in his underwear. How many, where's all the visual people? You can, you can see him now. And what are his, what are his uh, soldiers saying? Ooh, man, he's got leprosy, all right. Look at, he's covered in it. And I was helping him on and then this and that, the other, oh my goodness. And there he is now, shame, humiliated, humbled. And he goes down wading into the water and he goes under the first time and he comes up. No change. Do it again. No change. Do it again. No change. Do it again. The fourth time, no change. Fifth time, no change. What's the devil saying to him about this point in time? Well, what a class act you are. You and I both know nothing's going to happen the sixth time or the seventh time either. And uh, you just lost the respect of all your men and made an absolute fool of yourself in front of your main enemies. You know, all that kind of talk. But he's so far in, he's like, I might as well keep going. Six times, no change. Seven times, his flesh becomes like the flesh of a little child. Oh my goodness. He comes humbly back to Elisha and saying, look, we brought all this silver and all this gold and all these garments and they're all for you. I am so deeply grateful. And Elisha won't accept it at all. Now there's a, there's a, Another miracle in the story right there where the man of God won't accept the offering. <laughs> but you see, he doesn't want Naaman to feel like he helped this in any way. Like a, maybe he did it for the money, actually. Uh, no, no, he said, no. I can't take anything. You just be blessed. Well, then at least let me take two mules load of dirt back so I can stand on a bit of Israel and worship the one true God. And see, Naaman got his miracle because he, 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 he obeyed what he was told to do even though it cost him uh, deeply, greatly, in terms of humility. You know, I wondered, uh, why does the Lord like it when people fall down? I, I wondered that. I used to wonder that a lot. I think I sort of know the answer a little bit now. Back in the early days, in 94, 5, and Someone asked Randy Clark one time, why does everybody fall down? And Randy said, well, it's because they can't stand up. <laughs> but I was beyond that. I was like, why do you like this when everybody is seemingly uh, out of control, discombobulated? And see, that seems to be the very, the very issue. The Holy Spirit wants you to learn to surrender, to let him take over. And it may cost, cost you some of your dignity. Is that okay? And Heidi's going to be with us later this week, and she's got lots of stories that that talk about what happened to her while the Holy Spirit was coming powerfully upon her. And so Naaman went back home 
honoring the anointing that was on Elisha's life, Jesus went on from Nazareth to Capernaum to a different town that were honoring now the anointing that was on his life. And so we're confronted with this whole idea of honoring the anointing. And so I want you to just start to build toward that now. And uh, maybe beginning with your own pastor. Like, when was the last time you went to him and said, I so honor the anointing that's on your life? A lot of times after church, people, people go out for dinner and have pasta for lunch. <laughs> None of you, of course, do that. But what, what, if, what is it we lapse into? We lapse into looking at people after the flesh rather than after the spirit. You know, we have a saying of how familiarity breeds contempt. And the more you get to know that people are people and people are real and nobody's perfect, I hope you've learned that nobody's perfect, right? How many have learned that already? Nobody's perfect, especially you, right? Yeah, just let that sink in. And so that's true of pastors, too. And uh, <clears throat> I remember one time in Toronto a number of years ago, um, some of you remember Kevin Alfred, who was... Uh, who was interning with Carol and I, and you know, he traveled the world with us, went all over the place. Well, his dad went to high school with me. His name was George. And so after the meeting one Sunday, I walked to the back and George was there and we got talking and he starts laughing his head off. He said, John, I just can't believe you. Here you are, you're going all over the world and you're preaching and you're doing this and you're doing that, ha, 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 who? Who on earth would have ever dreamt that you of all people would be doing this? And see, he's saying that because he knew me back in high school. And I'm telling you, high school was the flesh. But something happened to that guy. He met Jesus and then he got filled with the Holy Spirit and... Uh, my world changed. Still not perfect, but a whole lot better than it was. And so we need to honor the anointing when we look at one another after the spirit. And so we need to honor one another. We need to honor the pastor. And uh, I want to ask you this sometimes the person that we least honor the anointing in their lives is ourselves because we we think of wow could I get out there and pray for the sick could I get out there and impart the anointing of the Holy Spirit and we're like oh I could never do that. And we have a long list of disclaimers. Uh, I'm too old now for that. I'm too young yet for that. Or I'm just a housewife. Or I'm only a student. Or I'm only a child. Or I've never been to Bible school. Have you heard that one? I don't think Peter and John went to Bible school either, actually. I'm not very good in front of people. Well, I'm just a former alcoholic or a former drug addict. What excuse are you using to disqualify yourself and dishonor the anointing that has been poured into your life? That's what I want to know. 
Stop hiding behind an excuse and start to honor your anointing. And I want you to say to yourself, I'm a Christian. If you're a Christian, wave at me excitedly. Okay. Now, I told you at first that the word in Greek is the diminutive form, which means little anointed one. Imagine they called them little anointed ones. Why did they do that? Because they were anointed. They went around healing the sick, praying for people, miracles were happening. That's who those early Christians were. I mean, think about their assignment. If you think ours is tough, there's a small group of them. I don't know, like, where do you want to start counting? Maybe 500. And um, Jesus told them, guys, here's the assignment. We want to preach this good news to the entire world, and then the end will come. How long is that going to take? Yeah. A couple of thousand years. That's their assignment. But, but let the reality of it sink in. Wait a minute, wait a minute. We're going out to the Greek Roman world and we're going to tell them, hey, turn away from the gods of Greece and Rome and start to follow the Jewish God as he's revealed to us through Jesus the Messiah. In the natural, fat chance, right? But see, the reality is the Jewish God is God. And Jesus is the Messiah. And so the miracles were genuine. And when they touched the lives of those people with that anointing, um, it just ended up with masses of people coming into the kingdom. And I think we're headed for another uh, operation, kind of like what happened in the book of Acts and happened in the early church. Because when you think about the, the book of Acts, that was tremendous that we're in about two to, two to 300 years, they won the entire Greek Roman world to Christ. I mean, how did that happen? It parallels the... The, the stories where Jesus, in the beginning of his ministry, tells Peter, okay, thank you for the use of your boat. Now push out into deeper water. Let your net down for a catch. And Peter looks at him like, what? I fished all night. We caught nothing. But he held his gaze and so, okay, out they go. And now the net is so full he has to call his partners and they fill both boats with fish. And even at that, the net is starting to break. And that happened at the beginning of this ministry. When the church was new, uh, they swept the whole Roman world into the kingdom. But after the resurrection, sort of at the end of his ministry, if you will, the scene happens again. They, the guys are discouraged. Peter says, I'm going fishing. About seven of them went with him. They fished all night and caught nothing. And so, okay, the sun's up. They're coming into shore. They're almost at shore. Because uh, they fished at night. They hung lanterns over the side. The lights attracted the fish and they netted the fish. But once the sun comes up, forget about it. But someone's on the shore saying, hey, have you caught any fish? Yeah. No. Well, throw your net on the other side of the boat and you'll catch. You can almost hear them. What? Who's the wise guy? And somebody said, well, why not? We've got to wash the net anyway. Throw it in. And now there's so many fish, they can't bring it in. They row the boat, dragging the net behind them, but they actually drag the net to shore. And I think there's a, there's a metaphor there 
where it just may be that this final harvest is going to be so huge that they don't get properly processed through the church. They just get dragged right to heaven's shore. <laughs> And with all of that, the net didn't break, it says. We've got some exciting days coming up, friends. Some exciting days. But listen, it's all depending on the anointing. Now, when Jesus said, throw your net on the other side of the boat and you'll catch, there's a couple of things there. Number one, they needed to do it. If they're like, oh, that's dumb. We're not doing that. Just forget them. I don't know who you are, but go away. We're not doing that. Oh, well, then you would have missed the whole point. But they did do it. And so then the anointing called um, all these fish, big fish, get over here into that net. And to their shock and amazement, there's so many fish they can't pull it all in. Now, what's the difference be, between fishing all night and having a supernatural catch like that? Fish is a, is a difference. Somebody said, do you like fishing? I, not really. I, I like catching, though. Well, when we start to do this under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, that's when um, fruitfulness really, really kicks in. So guys, I'd like you to put that scripture up on, uh, on the screen for me. And that's, that scripture is Luke chapter 4. Uh, we won't read it all, of course, but um, I want us to to say like the words that Jesus said to our hearts and get this into our spirit. So Luke 4, verse 18 and 19. Can you, can you put that up on the screen somehow? Um, whatever version you got, we'll read it from yours. I'm, I'm in New King James if you have it. And, uh, but I want to read it to you while we're getting this set up because it's one thing to read it, but it's another thing to read it in faith as it applies to you. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who were oppressed and proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. How are we doing, guys? Can we, can we do it? Yes, no, maybe. All right, how many have a New King James Version? All right, here you go. I'd like us all to stand. Maybe put your hand on your heart or on your belly or something. But when Jesus said this, he was not boasting. He was not wishful thinking. He was stating a powerful truth. Isaiah's words from Isaiah 61 are fulfilled that day in that little uh, synagogue in Nazareth. And so I'm, go I'm going to ask us all to read this, but I want you to announce it to your heart and to your spirit and to yourself because from today on, you're going out in the power of the Holy Spirit to make a difference in this world. 
The lame are going to walk, the blind are going to see, the deaf are going to hear, the dead are going to be raised. John chapter 14, verse 12 is true. Jesus said, the one who believes in me, that would be you, wave. The works that I do, you will do also. Stop right there. Don't even think about the greater works for now. Let's begin by doing the works that Jesus did. I mean, you can walk on water. You can make 150 gallons of wine. You can uh, calm the storm. You can open the eyes of the blind. You can raise Lazarus, who's been dead four days. Are you ready? Let's read it. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captive and recovering of sight to the blind and set at liberty those that are bruised and preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And that's where we'll end. Now listen, that wasn't bad. But this time I want you to announce it to yourself and let it in and take it on board. Because see, you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. You have spoken in tongues probably. You've had many prophecies over you. You had hands laid on you. You've been under the power many times. Friends, this is not just a parlor game. This is serious business. This is the deal of taking over the world for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's the business that we're in. And I want you to value the anointing and just proclaim this to your heart and to your spirit right now. Are you ready? Here we go. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Yay, Jesus. The greatest thing I'm convinced that can happen to any of us is to get filled up yet again by the power of the Holy Spirit. I think the deal is that you get filled up and then you give it away. You don't give it all away, but you give a lot of it away. You get filled up again and you give it away and you get filled up again. You give it away and you get, that's, that's how it is. We keep on being refilled with the Holy Spirit. Now, how many of you would like prayer? I mean, it's a big crowd here. So I'm just wondering what the best way to do it, but... Why don't, we, why don't we start with this? Find one or two people close enough to you. You can put your mask on if, if you prefer. And uh, if they prefer, or if you prefer, if they prefer. And uh, start to impart the Holy Spirit to one another. And I'm going to ask the ministry team in this uh, ministry here, you, you have ministry team, you, you know who you are. You guys just start going around and facilitate uh, what's going on and see if we can create a holy chaos in, in this room tonight. Father, I thank you so much for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I thank you, Lord, that heaven comes down 
and glory fills our soul. I ask you to come in the name of Jesus and fill these dear ones with your mighty power. Let it come in Jesus' precious name. Let the anointing flow upon your people. And all of you watching at home, yeah, get with a friend and let the spirit of the sovereign Lord come upon you right now in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you that the Holy Spirit is so contagious, so contagious. And we pray that you will release your presence upon them in Jesus' mighty, mighty name. Heaven comes down and glory fills our soul because we choose to honor the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for all that you are doing in this room. And I ask that you would come and fill your people full. Fill them, fill them, fill them full. And all these dear ones at home, dear Lord God, let heaven go right through the cameras. Fiery love comes upon each one in Jesus' mighty name. Fiery love comes upon them in Jesus' mighty, mighty name. Increase it on them. Fire on you, Duncan. Oh, Lord Jesus. Fire on them here. Let it come. Increase the anointing in this room. We take it, Father. Fire on them here in Jesus' mighty name. Fire on them both right now, in Jesus' mighty name. Fire on him here. Lord, we ask that you pour out your spirit like never before. Fire on you. Ugh. Double, 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 double. Increase it, increase it, increase it. <laughs> 